Azure seemed to appeal to me when I was looking around for a language to use. Um, I used to work in finance, but I don't anymore, which I'm happy about. Um, and I'm working on a new project, which is unrelated to Dump, but it's an uh, iPad app um, called Mixel for social art making. So if the contents of this talk seem interesting to you, um, we're hiring, so you know, feel free to talk to me after. Um, all right, so Dump FM is a site for image chatting, like image conversations. Uh, it was started in late 2009 by a New York City artist named Ryder Rips and uh, myself. And a few months after it was sort of going, um, uh, another programmer named Tim Baker sort of stumbled along it. And he liked it, he wanted to work with it. So at this point, you know, he's effectively a uh, founder as well. And it's written in Clojure, which is why I'm here. So, just to give a few of the, am I, by the way, obstructing this? Should I be over here? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Feel free. This is a good point to say that I chose a set of topics to talk about, sort of based on what I thought you might want to hear, but that doesn't mean I'm right. And you should feel free to steer me, you know, when you see fit, as you see fit, within reason. So, oh, crap. yeah, well, you know. All right, so it, you know, definitely raise hands at any time. Um, that would be, you know, great for me. Can you explain a little bit more, basically, what it is? Sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, I'm going to give a demo, actually. Oh, that is. That'd be good. That's actually the next slide. So maybe that should have happened before, but this is still in the introduction, uh, the preamble, I guess. So these are some things that uh, sort of. Um, marked what DumpFM was and what it was used for. Uh, DumpFM users, we, we put together a gallery of the work that they made. Um, we presented at the New York Tech Meetup. We've been used as a live image stream for concerts, and that's, that's kind of cool. And I don't know, it's been two years, and it's still going. Um, it's not actively being developed really to the same extent, but people are still using it, which is really gratifying. So I thought that um, I would just sort of show you how it works and what's going on, and let's take a look at what people are doing with it. So here's the site, oops, sorry. On the front page is sort of like an overview of the daily stuff. I, I'm tapping all over the place. This little heart thing shows the number of people who've liked something. Um, people who use it tend to focus on GIFs for you know, the kind of aesthetic, I guess, that they have and the motion that they have. And so you'll see a fair amount of GIFs. And this is a good time to enter the chat. This is basically Dump FM right here. It's a room where you see the other participants. You know, it's very similar to IRC in that regard. People are able to post images that instantly get sent out to everyone else. Um, and conversation sort of takes the form of this interplay between what I post and what you post in response. Um, looks like there's fair number of people on, maybe like, I don't know, 15. It's a reasonable amount. You know, so I can respond with what someone said and I can pull together a few different images to sort of say something. I can use web search to find something to post. Um, like I can make sort of a composition based on what other people are using. You know, we have a notion of user accounts where I can look at what somebody's done and I can see the things they've done which are most popular. Um, we have this notion of faving. If you like something, you can fave it, and then that just sort of acts as a, a favoriting for bookmarking and for giving sort of recognition. This is pretty good. I don't know if you're Street Fighter fans. That's definitely worth a fave. Um, we have a Hall of Fame, which is sort of the all-time top dumps. And it looks like it's taking a while to load, but hopefully it's working. Does this include tools to like help you make these images? Yeah, we have a set, not really at the level of, um, we don't, it's not anything like aviary, you know, or it's not anything like that. We don't have an editor built in. Um, there are certain things we do have. We have this tiling tool um, where you can put position images over each other, like live superimposing. And, you know, what's nice about that is that if you use it with GIFs, it's very easy to make a larger animated composition than if you tried to do that with Photoshop or whatever. Um, here's some of the... I guess the featured things that people have made. Um, I don't really know what this is, but some of these are pretty cool. And it's nice because there's a fair amount of, um, you know, 
change and variety in, in what people like over time. Uh, it's been cool to see that. Yeah, well, you know, it is what it is. Yes, so, i sorry, who asked that? Um, so what we do is we have a team of about 10 moderators, and they have the ability to mute users for various amounts of times. Um, occasionally we IP block people. Um, but it's, you know, a purely a labor of love, and sometimes things slide uh, if no one's there to catch it. Um, you know, we respond to things like uh, takedown notices and stuff. Yes? Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's all it is. It's, you know, like 20 people in the same room and they're just sharing images. And they're taking what other people are posting and responding to it. And that takes, you know, here's an example, this uh, little Kill Whitey thing. Uh, you can't see it, unfortunately, because it's username list. This is really not the right resolution for the demo. But, you know, there's some sort of coherent thought here. I couldn't tell you what it is, but I think they had something in mind when they posted that. <laughs> and um, maybe it's more apparent to the other people. I don't know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, does that help or? Okay. Definitely happy to answer other questions. One of the things that I sh uh, frequently a res common response to this seeing dump is I don't get it, um, which is sort of an in joke for the site for that reason. Um, but there's not really anything to get other than it's just responding to what other people are doing, you know. Um, and sometimes it doesn't make sense to you because the people are doing things that don't make sense to you. But that's just what they're doing. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. Well, semantics. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, we have Google Analytics. It's pretty much leveled off. Um, it gets around... Usually, well, almost always it gets over like a thousand visits a day, um, which is a reasonable number. I don't know, there's something like 15,000 registered accounts, but as you can imagine, probably most of them are inactive. Um, we have a typical range of concurrent users. It's usually around like, so you saw the list of guys here. It's usually when you log in at night, there'll be. I don't know, maybe 15, 20, 25 at the peak. It's interesting. So the peak is less than it was maybe six months ago um, or a year ago, um, but not by that much. And what's interesting about when it was getting much more popular, like that period, that ramp up, <coughs> the amount of the traffic would increase, the number of users you know, on analytics would increase, but the maximum size of the room didn't seem to ever go above 30 or 40. Um, and I think there's something interesting there about the dynamics of chat that lend itself to a certain, like, you know, regulation. You know, people say, come on, come on, come on, get in this, up to a point, and then it becomes too sort of incoherent, mm -hmm. and people splinter off. And we've, you know, experimented with side rooms, um, and those had some success, but they never really captured the attention the way the main room did. Um, yeah. Yeah, so actually, this isn't connected to dump, um, but I made a project for the node knockout, which is called Psyche, which is basically that model where you stare at an image or you're centered on an image, and you can suggest related images, and it uses those links between what you suggest and sort of the sprouting off to form a graph. And, you know, the graph sort of has local areas of content that probably don't mean much when you zoom out, but you know, one image leads to the next and leads to the next. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things that could be... Right. Unfortunately, it never got to that level of sophistication. I wish it did, because that would be really cool. But, um, but yeah, it's an interesting idea. I'd be curious to see if someone could take that and really polish it and make it work. Um, 
that would be cool to use. Yeah, I, I'm trying to understand the motivation for putting the you know, put in here and the interaction because uh, I don't know what people talk about. Mm -hmm. Is it some kind of like a gift for, for man or? It's definitely a gift. Um, like the people who use it, you can see like all the avatars are animated. Um, is it like 4chan? Like, is it like 4chan? Well, it's not really anonymous in the same sense. Like, there's no, you know, you have a user account. You don't have an anonymous user account. Um, but I guess the motivations are the same in that, you know, it's about connecting to somebody based on a topic. Um, it's not really any different from a regular forum, but because of the visual component, that sort of tends to attract people who have that as an interest um, and people who seek that out, you know, so... Um, no, I wouldn't really say that. I mean, it's, there's, a, there's often a shock element to it, um, but it's not, it's definitely not humor in the same way that if you went to like, you know, the Reddit uh, rage pics or whatever. You know, those are sort of based on like uh, setup, 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 punchline. Whereas, I mean, there's humor to this image, I think, of the kid in the car seat. Um, but then, you know, like, what's the connection between this? Well, it's not necessarily. It's <laughs> a good, it's a good response. <laughs> uh, maybe it's the motion of the images themselves. I don't know. It's. I think if I, you know, if you look at what the um, Hall of Fame has, you can see a pretty good variety of the different. Well. You know, like this isn't the joke of this. This is one of the highest rated, and it's probably one of my favorites. Um, this isn't being funny. This is, you know, something that somebody made and wanted to share. Um, and there's other things like that too. Well, anyway, um, so that's my take on that question. Yeah, I really like the first one. So what's cool about this one, actually, this was made by Tim Baker, who is um, one of the guys who helped make the site. And it's really his tool that I was mentioning. Um, this is made by taking all these different GIFs and layering them together using CSS, um, which, you know, lets you make this sort of like movie-like uh, composition using relatively primitive tools. Like the actual code to make the editor for that is very small. It's, yeah, and it has like CSS properties, so you can rotate things, and you know, that's how this is put together. Like, if you drag it, you can see that this is just an image that's positioned. Um, this isn't really part of Dump per se, but because there's a certain amount of overlap between, you know, people who care about positioning GIFs and Dump, uh, that's why it shows up here. Yes. So, uh, what have you gotten takedown notices for? Uh, well, there's a bunch of. It honestly hasn't been too bad. Um, every so often. Oh, sure. What do we get takedown notices for? There's a few random stories. Uh, there's just some occasionally people post illegal things, and you can imagine that there's not really much that's interesting there. But that doesn't happen too often, and it's easy to take down when it does. Um, the more interesting cases are when somebody who runs a site, usually some kind of, well, random to us anyway, uh, site based on their hobby. Like there's this guy who had this really cool uh, geology page. We had all these like geology animations, which were really cool. And so, you know, he saw that we were hot linking the image. That's, I guess, something I should say that Dump works on hot linking. Um, he's told us that, you know, we were infringing on his properties. It was illegal. And, you know, it's this nasty letter. Um, and so, you know, we took down the images, which is a shame because they're really cool. Uh, I mean, I guess, like, if I look at a website like this, it's like free, one can easily get a account and like, immediately uploading like, any image. Like, so we're actually not, uh, registration is closed. It's not very hard to get an account, but you sort of have to ask somebody um, okay. is one thing I would say, but not to interrupt your question.
Yeah, I mean that's that's the hope um, that the people who are here, and you know, that's one of the things that moderators are sort of invaluable for because they're able to sort of take the temperature of the room, and if somebody is doing something which, even if it's not like something pornographic or illegal or whatever, if it's sort of disruptive in a certain sense, like maybe they're just spamming the same image over and over again. Um, Yeah, right. Well, we also have an upload button and a webcam button. Oh, okay. um, but the truth is that because of how it works to like put things together, like something that's the thing that's really cool is the way that you know images will be composed together, and it's really hard to see it on the air. But it, when it happens, it's cool. But to do that, you know, the ideal way to do that is to drag the URLs in. You know, you don't want to upload one by one because then it goes into the chat. Um, so that's probably one of the reasons why people do a lot of hot linking. But there's no uploading. There is, sorry, there is uploading. Like if I press this upload button here, um, you know. So in other words, the, uh, the GIFs, the geology uh, GIFs, if somebody has instead of hot linking, they have a GIFs, then you know, the guy would go and not find it. Yeah, that's right. You might not notice, but you're not going to find it. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. All, when you're linking, you're not only grabbing people's images, you're grabbing the bandwidth. That's right. And you're leaving evidence. Oh, right. Yeah. Every yeah. Um, yeah, otherwise, I'm sure he would not be Google searching for his file names or whatever. Um, it's fair enough. Especially when, especially, you know, when people are in business. I mean, when I, when I worked for Writer's Health, we had people who did exactly that. They looked for, they looked mm -hmm. for, they Googled for stories and then said, by the way, you can either pay us a hundred and fifty we need to sue you and you're gonna to have to pay a hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or we can offer you a very reasonable contract to use this material. Right. <laughs> right. There's something with you on the uh HTML file to uh Yeah. Well the other thing is that the other thing that even when there people don't disallow that, and that will happen. Like the worst thing is something is coming back two months later and seeing that all the images don't work. So we actually have uh, an archiver script that you know gets run on certain ones so that we download the image and host them locally um, so that they don't you know, yeah. vanish over time. Because there's dead lim links all the time and there's, you know, it's sort of a shame how that happens. So what was it about closure that made this easier That's a good question. So I actually have a the, the slides that I have are more closure specific than dump specific. Um, well, that's, they're more, you know, implementation specific than they are specific, uh, about the experience of using dump or even the experience of, you know, like designing it or whatever. Um, so I'll definitely address that, but I guess I should ask if there's any other questions, or even like design questions or, you know, how it was put together or, or whatever. Yeah? <laughs> This guy? Yeah, this guy. Um, there's a fair amount of, of the interface here. Everything you're seeing is created by writer rips and all. give credit where credit is oh this isn't a very exciting web page but this is his there's a picture of him anyway that's good well here's a picture of him it's uh the first picture i saw so um i know well he has he has a whole section for uh gifts that i've made yeah, he's good he's uh he's good um I think a lot of it is proprietary programs. So one of the guys, one of the dump users, um, 
one of the early dump users and one of the moderators is a guy named Tom Moody, who's been making a certain style of animated GIFs, um, I think since, I want to say the 90s, for a while, you know, for far longer than um, most of dump users anyway. Um, and he talked about the program he used, and it's this old Windows only, you know. Um, I I don't know. I could find out. Don't know offhand. Um, sure. Um, I actually don't know what people in general are using. It's a good question. I think a lot of people just use Adobe products. Yeah. It's younger, I would say. It's like, you know, um, late teens, early 20s, a lot of college students. People whose eyes are still tolerant of intense flicker. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Hmm. Right. Well, you know, there's definitely a wide range, um, and there are people like that. You know, I, I mentioned one, um, but you know, I can think of a number. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, there's definitely a certain kind of. I don't know. Like this type of. Yeah, it's, I don't know, I don't want to say it's GeoCities like, but um, <laughs> it's, uh, there's a certain throwback to it, I guess. I don't GeoCities. know. <laughs> yeah. So when there is a conversation like that, what is the rate at which a new contribution appears? Sure. Well, it depends, you know, the number of people. Um, maybe once every second or once every few seconds if it's active. Um, oh, you mean like how many? How often do people like make new things to post, or do you just mean how how often do people make a like a, a message? Make a post. Uh, there's a lot of posts. There's like total almost six million posts. So I don't know what that is. Um, it's probably at you know peak time. Someone's posting maybe once every few seconds. That's my guess. Um, and people will, you know, get into it and they'll start going back and forth, although it's kind of disruptive and, and hard to follow. Do you think they're making those images just before they post them? Or no, definitely not. Um, collection I have prepared. The people who, like, post the things that they make, they're spending a lot of time on it and they're posting them sporadically, you know. People who are just sort of having a conversation, they find things, a lot of them have folders already. A lot of these are things which have already been posted. Um, there's this sort of feature where this little heart here is the list of images that you've already, oh, sorry about that, don't look if, uh, <laughs> this is a demo account, so I don't know who the last person to use this was. Um, but you know, it makes it easy to say, to post that. Um, you know, you don't have to go through and find it. So that's one of the ways in which people will sort of, you know, call back to previous threads. All right. Um, definitely, I like these questions, so I feel like I could keep answering them if you want. Um, you filter out um, the text that suggests images. And it's uh, so right. So actually, that's something that is an interesting topic we've had. And you can turn off and on text. And you can also turn off and on images. But that's just more of a joke than anything else. Like you can turn off text and images and you don't see anything. Um, but you know, if you turn on text, you're seeing that people are just saying these things. But the default when you go on is to not have text enabled. 
Um, and we didn't start it that way. That was actually kind of a recent change that we made, um, or that, that you know, specifically Ryder made, um, based on how he saw people were using it. Do you have some sort of statistics on what, on how many, how many posts have text at all? Um, oh, that's a good question. Oh, no. You get those. I mean, they're just in the database, but I haven't looked at anything like that that I remember. I mean, all of the not all the images that have been uploaded, yes, and all of the messages, yes. Um, but unfortunately, the message, you, the the linked images break, which is kind of a shame. All right. I think maybe I'll get back to the presentation and then I'll take questions at the end so we can revisit these topics. So that is dump FM in the flesh. Um, just a bit about architecture. It is built on composure. It uses Ajax pulling, no web sockets or lawn pulling or anything. Um, it uses a combination of a you know enclosure data structures to represent what's active. So you the client basically says what's new since timestamp and the server says here's what's new. Um, and the data is all archived in Postgres, and so that's how you can do these historical queries for what are the things that this user has posted, you know, like in a log format. Um, Nginx was added to the front end, um, and then sometime later, um, Tim Baker added Redis for something, and that seemed to work out pretty well, so we kept using Redis for more things. What's that? Redis is, I feel like somebody else might be able to, um, I've only used it for dump, but what Redis is, is it's just a very simple, it's not a SQL database, it's a NoSQL database. It's a key value store, but it has support for um, data structures like sets and sorted sets and hashes. So, you know, if you picture how you would implement something like the top posts of the day um, in SQL, where, you know, posts is measured by the number of, like the count of associated records, you know, you could write a SQL query for that, but you know, keeping it up to date and all that and materializing it. Um, with Redis, you can just say, increment this, this, this member in a sorted set, and it will, you know, bump it to the top or move it forward. Um, it makes it very simple to explain or to, to implement the kind of things that, you know, are sort of standard social um, site features. Um, we're hosted on Linode, and we use S3 for the bulk of, of um, the old images, although Initially, the images get uploaded to the Linode machine. What's the level of your It's pretty cheap. I don't know. It's. I mean, I don't know what cheap means. It's. Um, it's less than my cell phone bill. But I have an expensive cell phone. <laughs> no, it's like it's. Uh, it's the Linode is. Um, there's one Linode. That's, I think, thirty a month. We have backup for it. Uh, we don't go over the bandwidth for that, and I pull it with other things, so we don't go over the bandwidth. Um, we use S3, and S3 is generally like maybe 30 bucks a month, so less than 100 a month. Um, and so now let's get to the closure, because there hasn't really been much about closure. And I should say that um, certainly in this room, there are many people who've used closure more extensively than I have, and so, you know, this is somewhat. Um, it's biased and not author authoritative is, is what I'm sort of adding to everything I say. Um, and the reason I chose Closure was just an experience of, you know, having fun with Scheme and sort of wanting to, to relive that for, you know, this project. And that is definitely what I found. Um, Closure, the language, is very simple and clean and that's, you know, a joy to use. Um, the Closure libraries are pretty amazing in their breadth for the amount of time that they've been developed. Um, you know, people are doing monads and zippers and all these like ridiculous data structures and there's a lot of, um, you know, the IO libraries. Like it's an incredible amount of wealth there for such a new language. Um, and surprising libraries, not just sort of the standard set you would expect. Um, I'm a fan definitely of the JVM. There's always, you know, there's no shortage of job libraries for anything you want. Deployment's always very easy. Um, it's reasonably fast and reasonably robust. Um, 
And I'll say a little bit more about the concurrency primitives, but that's something that gets talked about a lot with Clojure, and I definitely can say, you know, they work very reliably, and they do what you expect. Um, it makes it easy to have a bunch of different concurrent requests going on, mutating shared data structures, you know, with, with transactionality and all that. Which ones did you find useful? Oh, geez, I mean, you know, just having, um, I, we used refs for everything. We used refs for everything. Um, well, that's not true. We mostly used refs. Because the model of a ref is just, you know, you have a list of the messages in a room. You have some other structure for a user. And so you want to say, all right, when a new message comes in, you know, add it to the room, add it to this maybe message queue. We have a, you, can, you can say, when you type a message, you can say at username, and then that pops up a little notification. Or when you like a message, you can, it shows up with a little uh, overlay notification, you know. And so those are all the different kind of data structures that are kept on the server. And uh, being able to, you know, mutate all of those at once in the same transaction, there's something clean about that. Um, it seems like that's the right way that it should be done. Are you using Jetty for the backend? Yeah, it's, it's Composure, but um, <laughs> can you use Composure without Jetty? I don't know if you can just compile it to a servlet or not, yeah. but... We're using just, you know, the bog standard of that. Um, that's, you know, the one slide about why Clojure is great. Um, there are a few issues that I ran into. One is that going between 2009 to uh, 2011, the Clojure ecostructure, uh, ecosystem has changed tremendously. Um, and now we're on Clojure 1.3, although I don't really know what the difference between 1.2 and 1.3 is. but. Um, you know, the transition from 1.0 and 1.1 and, and to 1.2, those were big changes. The adoption of uh, LenInGen is, is big. Um, you know, Composure going the way of Ring is big. And each of those things, when you're working on something like, you know, at all times I was working on a job with Clojure. And so I would code uh, uh, on, on Dump. And I would work on Dump while, you know, like on my commute or something. And so when you find out that the community is passing you by and you just want to work on your features, there's sort of a tension there. Um, but I should say that this is, you know, for the best, that's what it means to be using a new language. And so it's hard to really say that it's Clojure's fault, but it's definitely something that, you know, is sometimes frustrating. Um, some Clojure libraries are a pleasure to use, but not as fully featured as you might want. Like I remember the Redis library in particular was easy to get started with, but it didn't implement all the features. Um, and you know, I think the right thing to do there would have been to actually implement them myself and submit them back. But what ended up happening was I just used the Java library, uh, which was fine. Um, <clears throat> it was okay anyway. Um, and you know, especially when I got started with, with Composure, there was a few things like sessions that didn't quite work um, the way I needed them. You know, and so I had to sort of untangle the source code for Composure and Fortunately, Composure was well enough isolated from the Jetty mess that I didn't have to go that far. But even you know, reaching through Composure is, wasn't a lot of code, but I think it is a testament to the fact that these you know, core language, uh, libraries and tools are still being built. Um, and that's you know, the definition of a growing pain. Um, and there's some bummers. So we were running on a small Linode, um, which would have, I think, something like 512 megabytes of memory when we started. And that's not a lot for Java. And that's especially not a lot when you're also running the database on that machine. And you don't necessarily always know how to optimize your queries, or you forget to, as the case might be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you run Java, or you're running the JVM, and you run out of memory, and suddenly your CPU usage, you know, shoots up to like 400% or whatever, because, you know, it's, um, it's garbage collecting itself to oblivion. You can't even SSH in, because the machine is hosed. Um, and you don't want that. And that's not very good. And so part of the lesson there is that you should do a better job architecting your application. And that's one of the things I learned. But the other is that Java does not handle you know, yeah. that situation very well. Um, Java's image processing is not very, it's powerful, but there's, it's very crufty. Um, it's been added on various occasions, you know, like, you know, different point releases to the JDK. Um, there are things you can do where if you use, you know, if you read a JPEG and save it out, you do it the naive way, you'll end up 
completely shifting the colors. Um, you know, and there's sort of caveats to all these things. Uh, they're kind of a bummer to deal with. Um, and the last point is a little, a little, um, uh, maybe controversial is the right word, and also underspecified. But my experience using the closure STM, you know, like writing these do sanks and ensuring other variables and all that, um, they satisfied the need of being able to have concurrent access to mutable variables. They worked in that regard. I'm not saying they didn't work, but it seemed like the amount that I had to learn to get to that point um, didn't really justify, wasn't justified by the benefits um, compared to, you know, much simpler approaches like, um, you know, if you can contrast it to Scala, you know, they use actors for a lot of things. Um, and if all you care about is sort of serializing these small updates, um, which seems to me is, is a much more common case, then you don't have to wade through all that machinery to sort of get to where you want to go. And I guess the point of that isn't that, you know, like the STM is sort of a counterpoint to threads, right? They're not really a counterpoint to actors and they're not really, to, to, you know, single threading things. Uh, sorry, yes? Are you saying that, like, when you're, when you're doing stuff with actors, it's, it's like you, you tend to do things in smaller units, therefore it's easier to deal with it, so that you don't yeah. have a problem? Here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, you know, Closure's STM is great for the same sort of things that locking would be good for. When you have a bunch of variables that you want to share between threads or between, you know, con concurrent accesses, and you don't necessarily want to specify in advance the different ways that those accesses can happen. You just want to make sure that certain guarantees are met about, you know, the order in which certain effects are placed. But I don't know, you know, I've done a fair number of different types of programming and that's never been a very pressing need for me. And, you know, this, you know, Clojure is just a website. You could have done it single, you could have done it in Node where there isn't any threads at all really and it would have been fine. Um, so that's why when I say this, if you feel like you have an experience in your mind where the STM was great or, or you know, locking was great, you know, you know best for that situation. Um, it's a fair like, point. You were using it where it wasn't even needed. Maybe you needed one. Well, but you know, if you have multiple re requests being serviced at once, you need to do something. I mean, Clojure also has actors, you know? And you can use actors for that. And that's a pretty good response to what I'm saying. But you still have to use that baggage of, you know, here's where you're, you're conjing and, and, you know, you do it in a do sync and all that. Um, Sure, yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of, you know, whenever you have a bunch of refs and you need to update them and you put a do sync and you make updates to all the ones you want and you can sometimes make, you know, associative updates so you don't um, need to require a full resetting, like, you know, with the appending to a list and store to, instead of setting the whole list, um, ensuring the variables that you're necessary to update. So um, you're using this purpose section. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fair way to put it. I mean, that's what I'm saying, right? Like, that's all I really want. Yeah, like, I would be happy with a single... But the thing is, right, that, you know, the, the point of it is that you can have different parts of your application. Um, you don't have to specify in advance or up front what the order of interaction is, things like that. Um, that's sort of the benefit of it. But, you know, you can do a lot with, with much more simple approaches, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, anyway, I don't know. I'd be happy to talk more about this. The fact that I put a question mark here just me means that I don't have a great deal of conviction about it. Um, and I certainly didn't explain very thoroughly what I mean. Yeah? Um, I've also been doing like small like web projects on the side. Um, and I kind of had like the same experience. Um, but I think it might just be like having like a couple of really good examples would have sort of Help me along. Like, you mean uh, you mean in you learning closure that would have helped? Um, 
Yeah, I would. I, would I, got, buy it. I got what I wanted at the end, but it was just like a lot of like, is this the right way to do it? I'm not sure, like, like how I, have you actually used these things? Or, right. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm saying is that, you know, that mechanism, there's a lot of machinery there, which most people at most contexts are getting along, you know, fine without it. Um, and so what am I saying? Am I saying that, you know, you, there should be a model like, like, like Haskell or the STM, you know, there's different implementations, but they're not baked into the language. Maybe that's what I'm saying. Um, happy to talk about it more, but I think, you know, I don't have anything more interesting to say right now, so. Sure. Well, what it does is just what, you know, um, I'm sorry, what's, uh, what's your name? John. John. It does what John says, right? Like if you have an actor and that actor owns a variable and you send a message to that actor, that actor is only processing one thing at once. And you know that if, the, if, 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 if you have the precondition that whatever the actor does is correct for whatever it part of the data it owns, then your application will be fine. Um, you know, so like I was doing iPad programming, and in the iPad what you have to do is, you know, you, you're very constrained in terms of your CPU and your memory and all that. Like, you're coding much more tightly than you would on a server, like running in the JVM. But you can get by doing everything you want. In fact, you have to, because this is how the GUI libraries are, on the main thread. Everything has to be done on the main thread in terms of updating the UI. And so, you know, you push things off to the background and you bring it back, and that's fine. The, what you can do on the main thread is very powerful and is most, you know, it seems like, I guess what I'm saying is, if you can do very tightly orchestrated um, performance work and do it all just sort of walking on a single thread, is is that you know what does that mean about? Yeah, it's really easy to get bugs that way though. That's, mm. so, I mean, that's, that's exactly where you way of screwing yourself. Yeah, if that's that's the, a fair response. It's uh, the the essence of it is to make sure that that when it comes time to update things, that there's only one update. <coughs> and whether you you see that as a separate actor or as a you know as a critical section or as a rendezvous or as any of a dozen other models, doesn't matter that much. Mm -hmm. you use the one that's cheapest for the language you're using. The, the, the essential point is that they don't they don't break on you. It, that you're you're only doing it in one place and you can watch that place. Right. Sure, it's single threaded through that place. Right. And so whether you're doing that with a single thread or whether you're doing that through actors, I don't know. There's also matters of flexibility and and architecture yeah, that we're not really talking about. Is the, it's the actor itself that's single thread. You know, like right. Decuse one message at a time. Right. So that's a way that you can yeah. you know parallelize across all your cores while still be maintaining the illusion of. Uh, right. So maybe what you're talking about is just. The Mm. Like, Interesting. Yeah, well, I don't know. Like the model of you being able to. I don't know. It seems like most work. Like if you take, say, like if you take the example of Node, what Node shows is that you can get by pretty well by running everything that touches a shared data structure in one thread and then just waiting for all your network requests. And then, you know, that's specific to a certain type of work. Um, yeah. Sure, I'm sure but... You can do pretty well with this one thread, but I was thinking that, you know, with all the one board and uh, other boards, whatever, we would be trying to move on to, uh, you know, all these threads. That's what I've been trying. Yeah, I, I think that's fine, but the question is, what is the multi-threading that you're doing? Is it about doing CPU intensive work, or is it about um, shunting something off to the background and it coming back? Like, you know, in the case of uh, if you're doing a bunch of image processing, that's very easy to shunt off, and it comes back, you know, once the processing is done, and you can go on to the next step with it. And that's an architecture which utilizes as many cores as you have, assuming you have enough work, um, but is very easy to orchestrate. Um, I guess what I'm saying is that in a case where the access to the data isn't really the uh, performance critical part, you're getting a lot of, yeah, and I feel like any more than this is, is uh, not what any of us wants. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to say a few things about, you know, I guess the, 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 
when you give advice, it's, 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 it's that you're talking to a younger version of yourself. Um, and so this is effectively what I'm doing. With, you know, these are things that I learned, but I didn't always do them right. Um, and the first thing that's kind of interesting about when you're putting the software together um, that people are using, uh, you don't have a support contract or whatever. Um, if you care about their experience, you're setting yourself up to be that person who, you know, your friends will call you or email you or text you or whatever when something doesn't work. And that's not any different from, you know, if you're working at a company, obviously. But the difference is that this can happen when you're in your job, um, when you're out, you know, any number of things. And so the importance of writing uh, <coughs> code that responds well to, you know, fluctuations is amplified by the lack of resources you have. Um, you know, something that really helped and we should have done much earlier on was giving our administrators or our moderators the tools to respond to content problems. Um, but you know, there's still problems like the GC cycle that I mentioned. Um, if you run out of memory on your server and you don't have the right tools to kill the process and restart it, then you know, that's going to require manual intervention and that's the thing that investing in time, you know, up front will, will pay off down the road. Um, secret that kills the server and restarts it. That would have been good. Because sometimes, you know, the problems come when you're not at a computer. And then what do you do? You know, you rush back to your laptop. Um, and we were really lucky that, that um, one of the, the people that I mentioned, Tim Baker, liked the site enough that he was willing to help build it. You know, that was really great. And I think we sort of lucked out with that. But uh, if you get the chance to have that happen to you, it's, it's wonderful, and you know, you, it's, it's not that serendipitous. You can also try to encourage it. Um, uh, this is sort of just the same kind of um, general software engineering development, but I feel like being sort of a side project or a project for fun shifts it a little. Uh, and what I mean by bus-driven development is that you should code as if you will get run over by a bus tomorrow. And um, <laughs> that's it. The code is how it is, you know, and it has to, whoever picks it up has to be able to work with it. Um, and when it's something that you're doing for fun, it's very important that you be able to resume your work and enjoy it, you know. That's the problem with putting something off, because no one's going to force you to get back to it. And sometimes they should, but there's nobody there to do that, you know. Um, if you simplify your code, if you take the, 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 the productivity hit of upgrading to use the new version of Clojure or you know, refactoring your builds, um, that's not a new feature, but it makes it more fun to work on. And that's sort of a virtuous cycle. Um, and the last point there is, you know, it's fun to reinvent things, but you don't always need to do it. And sometimes you shouldn't, you know, especially when the things you're working on, you know, the goal is that other people will be able to pick them up with low cost. Um, and the amount of time to take something that sort of works for yourself and push it to something that's robust enough and, 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 and reliable enough for someone else to use, you know, there's a huge gap there. Um, there's, a, uh, there's a related principle which I call the Mickey Mouse Watch principle. It, the great thing about Mickey Mouse Watches is they, they may not be that pretty and they may not be that accurate, but when you drop them, even if they stop, you pick it up, shake it, and it starts again. Right. It's a big virtue. Um, a, a commercial, fairly low traffic website that I, that I worked on in 1999 and 2000 was definitely still running 10 years later without any kind of software engineer touching it. It just worked. Yeah, it's sort of amazing. I feel that way with Dump. I'm well, amazed that it still One of the, one of the ways it just worked was that it, 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 uh, it entirely rebuilt itself every hour. Hmm. There was new, if there were, Content wasn't coming in that fast because it, it didn't take content from the public. So content, content only came in from content creators. So every hour we say, okay, what content is available? Even if we've seen it last hour, we don't care. We just built it all again. It's fast. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, like if you know, it takes 10 minutes to build it all again, so what? That's, out of, that's 10 minutes out of every hour. The website is working hard. The rest of the time it's, it's, you know, people are just picking up static content that costs nothing to serve. Right, yeah. I mean, you know, that's, I guess, sort of like the principle of caching in a specific case, but yeah. lowering complexity where you can really pays off. Sorry? 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 Sorry?
when people called me and said, hey, the website is broken, I said, wait an hour. All right, and uh, we're nearing to the end, and so I guess this is something that um, I think that when we build something, for us to really be productive with it, um, and to be able to pick it up down the road, it takes a very conscious effort to extract out sort of the nitty gritty parts of, you know, this data is stored in this database um, and needs to be joined with this from this data store. Um, from the higher level meaning of the application. Um, and that's, you know, that's the notion of abstraction. Um, but in the web world, you'd sort of be surprised at what passes for, you know, software engineering. Um, Rails, you know, came along and what it managed to do was it said, here's a structure in which you can fit the notion of, you know, fetching stuff from a database and putting it in templates and spitting it back to the user. And all steps of that are very simple, but it was a very powerful thing when it was put together um, because it sort of simplified the space in which you know, an application would be built. Um, I feel like real-time web coding is still in that way. It certainly was in 2009. I haven't looked extensively in the last year, but I don't really see much. There's, you know, there's Lyft. Um, there's a company making this thing called OPA. There's, I saw a Perl Mojolicious. Um, but I don't know, I guess here's a question. You know, how many of you have worked with like a real-time web framework? Um, what real-time means is that, you know, when you spit out, when you load a page, there's something in the background there which is fetching in new results and using them to populate the page. Like, you know, that's sort of the notion of a message queue, but it's also requiring JavaScript, which is running in the page and re-rendering new additions. You know, there's like this bi-directionality between your models and your templates. And there's more of that, you know, there's, um, point in time. Yeah, well, so you could imagine taking the limit of hitting a database every second to, you know, going to the WebSocket model where things are streamed with no holding period, no queuing. Um, and that doesn't seem like an important distinction to me. Um, what you're saying is that common frameworks like Django and Rails support that as, you know, a first-class entity. Yeah. Yeah, well, but see, that's the thing, right? Like, Node isn't, Node is built for real time, but it's not a framework, right? Um, and I have, I am a little bit familiar with Node, um, you know, and that, that's why people are building frameworks on top of it, like Express. But they're not abstracting this core notion of, you know, users and queues and being able to take events like, you know, very simple things. Like if you want the five most recently posted um, messages by a user, right? Like what is that? Well, that could be a call to the database or that could be processing the events of a, as they come by through the, uh, the, 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 the controller and, and saving them, um, being able to express semantics on that stream of events. Again, those things aren't unified. Um, I mean, when, when I look at um, something built on JDM or I guess the server model, it's very clear that Java has a notion of multi threaded web server. And it's, the life cycle of the response in PHP and Django and Ruby is you don't, there aren't global variables on, on the server which you can reference from one thread to another. You just don't do that. If you want to represent any kind of global state, you do that via the database for a song external call. Java has that with uh, everything that I've seen, I think, about um, the way I 
Yeah, I mean, none of what I'm saying is specific to a single process. Um, what I mean is that you're talking about, I guess, the machinery of a request comes into the web server and it's processed and, you know, it's run through a servlet and some response is spit out. Um, and that's why classical Java frameworks are so god awful hairy because they are not shared nothing. Um, shared nothing, the, vir the, the virtue of shared nothing is not performance, it's not at all. It's not, it's intelligibility. It's uh, shared nothing systems can be understood. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess what I would say I don't see evidence of um, are tools to make the process of, you know, like the lower level mechanics of how a message is delivered to a browser, like maybe that's web sockets and whatever, that's being abstracted in a bunch of different ways, like, you know, socket IO is the JavaScript framework which abstracts that, or a library rather. Um, but then, and you know, there's all sorts of, of uh, mappings between, you know, uh, a Python class and a database in Postgres or whatever. Um, but that's not really the level of abstraction I'm talking about. Um, I don't have code. It, it sounds like what you're, what you're saying is like basically the distinction between like a batch processing mainframe and a time sharing, a time sharing computer, mm. where you have people accessing the same resources at the same time, and you need to you need to deal with this. You know, these processes need to have this person's view on the system and needs to update in real time. Um, and it, it needs to interact with what everybody else is doing in the system. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's, I think that's that's a reasonable way to put it. Whereas existing web frameworks are more batch oriented. You have a request, you process the request, right. you write it to your storage, you know, you read and write to your storage and then you, you move on, you give your response and you move on. Even if it's in a, even if in the browser you're using Ajax or whatever, Right, you, you, you process each thing as each request that comes from the browser as the word batch. Yeah, yeah. I guess what I'm saying is being able to chain like you know a set of semantics from an event from a user all the way through the different implications it has, all the way through the notifications and updating stats and stuff. Like if you look at um, like Lyft, you know, has this notion. Um, if you're familiar with Asana, they blogged about um, the language they were developing for reactive web programming. Um, and then they downgraded it to a framework because building a language as a startup is kind of not a great idea. You know? Yeah, I mean, really what this is doing, it, it is writing everything to the database. It's just a little itty bitty in memory database. STM provides the um, the asset guarantees that you want without, you know, the overhead of the big database on the disk and da 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 But, you know, otherwise everything is happening exactly the same way. Yeah, that's the virtual like the same things in memory. Yes, that's yeah. exactly my point. So exactly. Even at the nitty gritty level, it's kind of something yeah. like that. Yeah. But I feel like that's the wrong level of abstraction to be working at. Because if you have an STM and it's working, you know, you, you've coded it to work right, that's great. But that's um, what you've got. That's what your refs are then later on. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not particularly talking about dump because okay, dump is a very special case. It's running in a single process. You know that doesn't. I mean, what does that count for? Um, like a shared data model. Well, I'm talking about you know like you can think of an application as as um, you know data structures possessing certain semantics. You know, so like if you want the model of a message, you know, a stream of messages on certain channels, you know, there's a variety of ways to accomplish that. You can do that with Redis. You can do that with you know these any number of the message buses which exist. Um, and then you're tied into that, you know, specific, um, I mean, you know, you can always build the right layer of abstraction for that. I mean, Facebook kind of has the same, same thing. Each person is posting whatever at various times. And then on your page, you don't want to see everything that happens or, you know, you know if you load it up once a day, you don't want to see, oh, these are the five things that have happened in the last 15 seconds. Okay, great. What use is that to me? I want to see, okay, this is stuff that, like, you know, my friend circle is talking a lot about. It's which is something they, they recently implemented. Or these are things that uh, my friend circle, this is one specific thing that a lot of people in my friend circle are involved in. 
right? You want to see that kind of thing. And so each user has a, ends up with a different view of this stream of information that's flowing. Right. So you're describing being able to write and and you know a filter say on on events and have that be abstracted from the actual code, which says you know. When an input comes in, look up the set of things relevant for this user and then route it on. Um, yeah, rank these according to these criteria, blah, 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 which you could implement using the SQL database. You know, you could write every single event to the database and, and query it and see which ones are most important or whatever, but you would want something that, be, that, that evolves over time more efficiently, um, you know, ideally. <coughs> Right, and I guess the core of that is being able to abstract whatever particular choice you make from the expression of your application. Um, because any given problem, when stated, has you know a reasonably clear solution to it. You've got the flow of events. You've got the um, the criteria that are used to determine what's important, and you've got the way that the view is constructed for a specific user. Right. Right. So, the, you know, you, you want to be able to address each of those independently. Right. So yeah. Are you talking more about you've got some sort of shared model of the data that's coming in from all different directions that just knows what streams you need to push out to without having to think about how it gets there or where it came from? Well, it's not a matter of not having to think about it. It's really having the right abstraction to express it. I'm talking about the um, mechanics you think about. Like, sure. Well. I mean, any given, you can imagine all the different ways you might accomplish that. You know, you can use message queues. You know, you could get by with uh, the notion of a Redis channel. Like, you know, these are all different strategies you could use, and probably for the kind of needs of this, they would be totally fine. Um, You're talking about one level higher in abstraction than that. So yeah, like a sort of, you know, a set of standard ways to say, these are the components of my application, and they have these needs, and they need to talk in this way. You know, being able to say, all right, I have this stream of events that need to get pushed out at the same time it needs to be persisted in this way. Um, okay. Definitely happy to talk more about it um, after. And with that, this is the end of my presentation. And definitely thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take questions, talk more about Dump or. Um, I appreciate that. That wasn't a very clear conclusion, but you, you recovered.